Hello there and good evening clubbers and welcome this evening to something a little bit different on book club something we've not ever done before or read we have here Ian Fleming's short stories the quantum of solace the complete James Bond short stories and so if you didn't know who Ian Fleming was as it just said there he created these short stories with James Bond in and they were turned into the films throughout the 70s, 80s, and in more modern day, uh, the Daniel Craig, Piers Brosnan, uh, who else, Sean Connery, all of the iconic James Bond characters, Daniel Craig being the most recent of them. And so the Quantum of Solace is the, the title story, but also within this book, there is... From a View to Kill, For Your Eyes Only, Risico, The Hildebrand Rarity, Octopussy, The Property of a Lady, The Living Daylights, and 007 in New York. So if you are interested in any of those that I've just mentioned, get them in the chat, let me know, and I'll be sure to get those in the poll too, because yeah, I think they're going to be rather exciting, because they have uh, a big uh, uh, a big name right behind them and there's another one here uh, Dr. No and Moonraker which are more more in-depth stories perhaps but let me just read you the the blurb quickly because I couldn't find much information about it online uh, before I begin hello there Rodney who says right on you read in Fleming great choice hello there soul sister who says good evening clubbers and Two Zebras Running is here as well. Hello there, Alex. He says, hi, everyone. Haven't seen you guys in a while, and it's nice to see you. I hope you're doing well. Um, Woody B and Ice comes in and says, hello, clubbers. So perfect timing. Solstice says, this will be the first time for a James Bond book. I love the movies. Hoping the book is equally exciting. And we'll find out, Soul Sister. I've never read an Ian Fleming either, so it's the first time for me also. And the blurb says, Bringing together all of the James Bond short stories in one volume for the first time. This is the ultimate celebration of suave and deadly secret agent 007. Whether he's making an unexpected discovery in the Bahamas, hunting down a Cuban hitman in wild country, smashing an international drugs ring in Rome, on the trail of a murderous secret in the Caribbean, Caribbean, or foiling a surprisingly alluring assassin in Berlin's Sniper's Alley, dangerous missions and beautiful women come with the job for James Bond. And this agent is always a consummate professional. And let's get right into it, because like I said, you can't really find out any information about what the Quantum of Story, uh, Quantum of Solace story consists of. I could have shared the plot, the synopsis from Wikipedia, but then that would sort of spoil it. As it's a spoiler alert, it just tells you the story. Um, and so I think we the best thing to do is just to read it. It's only short, 20 odd pages, just over that, 25 pages maybe. And I'm not going to do uh, Daniel Craig's accent. I'm not going to try. Maybe I'll just deepen and uh, make my voice a little bit suave, if I even if I need to do that. But I will. Um, I will see how I feel and try and do uh, a little James Bond. But hello there, Caroline Songbird says hello, friends. And Caroline, we will be this time tomorrow night. We'll be reading. Chapter 3 of Walden, which I believe it's Solitude, if I'm right. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, this time tomorrow, I hope you're available and we'll be reading Walden. And hello there, Nicholas, says, hi all from France. And hello there, welcome. So, if you'd like to hear more Ian Fleming after this, We've got, like I say, Walden, Beelzebub coming up, an Enid Blyton pole, more potential Ian Fleming. I did a video earlier today where I was talking about um, my book haul. I've received a load of wonderful new books. You can go and watch that after, after this. 
Uh, and if you're looking forward to all of that coming up here at Book Club, please consider liking the video, subscribe to the channel, share the show with your like-minded friends, and of course, and also the app. The app is going, it's flying, it's growing, and lots of new members, lots of new requests. The Meditations is now finished, and the next uh, feature length, if you like, is going to be Wind in the Willows, and I'll continue to upload Walden and Beelzebub, but Wind in the Willows will be next, and if you were to sign up any book that you wanted that wasn't on there, I would happily add that for you as part of your welcome package, as well as all of the massive library, so give that some consideration. Donna Harper, hello there, says, who doesn't love a bit of 007? Shaken, not stirred, that's right, uh, Donna, nice to see you. Soul Sister says, who's your favourite Bond actor? And Robert Benson says, hi Lewis and listeners. Hello there, Robert. It's nice to see you. Uh, yeah, I would say I like Daniel Craig for the, for the modern. But who's the... Um, I'm going to have to have a look because I can't recall his name. I should, I should be able to recall his name, but I do have one in mind who sort of when I was the youngest, when I was young and watching James Bonds, I, um, mm, there was one that really, I, I remember, uh, James Bond actors, here we go, no, not those, oh, Roger Moore, I used to like Roger Moore as well, so I'm going to say, as you know, I, I struggle with uh, favourite, my favourite one, but I'm going to go uh, Daniel Craig and Roger Moore. Uh, Roger Moore for the nostalgia. I would have watched these those James Bonds with Roger Moore when I was a young boy. And of course, the most modern James Bond is Daniel Craig. And I think he's a great actor. And I remember when I was very young, before I really got into the books, I saw an interview with him when he first did it, Casino Royale. And they said, what do you like doing, you know, when you're not working and acting? And he said, oh, I, you know, I like walking, being in nature, I like reading. And I thought, reading, you know, <laughs> what are you on about, reading? <laughs> and little did I know that I'd be reading a lot more. So uh, Donna says, never liked him until Daniel Craig. Uh, Sean Connery weren't too bad. Um, uh, Alex asks, what are we reading? It's a James Bond book. If you've seen James Bond. The Quantum of Solace. Uh, yeah, well, The Wind in the Willows is on the channel, Alex. You can go listen to that. Um, Woody B says, well, Donna, wouldn't say I don't like it, but I was never really uh, into it for some reason. Maybe Book Club will change my mind. What have you said there? Uh, so uh, Alex is getting ready for bed. So chatting very rarely. Soul Sister helps me out there with Roger Moore. <clears throat> um, so yes, thanks, Soul Sister. I had to, I had to get Google to help me out to find out Roger Moore. But yes, Nicholas is personally. I prefer Pierce Brosnan. Okay, okay. Like you say, we we all we all like what we like, don't we? Um, Donna says my dad was a huge Bond fan, but Sean Connery. I remember him not being too bad. Hello there, John. Um, Robert Benson said, I snuck in underage to see Sean Connery in Goldfinger. We won't, uh, we won't hold you. Um, we won't hold you for that. We won't judge you, uh, Robert. That's fine. Donna says the Daniel Craig ones with Judy Dench. I have enjoyed though a bit more like Mission Impossible. That's right. Mission Impossible and also the Bourne series, the new bonds with, um, Daniel Craig are more, yeah, like you say, Donna, more like Mission Impossible and Jason Bourne s speeding it up. And um, John says, I love this channel so much, and I'm very happy to hear that. And it's good to have you here with us at Alive. Woody B says, hi, Zebra, I'll be listening in bed too, so I'll probably um, a quiet, a quiet chat for me too, so... With all that being said, by way of introduction and the books and our favourite James Bonds, let's go. 
The Quantum of Solace by Ian Fleming James Bond said, I've always thought that if I ever married I would marry an air hostess. The dinner party had been rather sticky, and now that the other two guests had left accompanied by the ADC to catch their plane, the governor and Bond were sitting together on a chintzy sofa in the large office of work's furnished drawing room trying to make conversation. Bond had a sharp sense of the ridiculous. He was never comfortable sitting deep in soft cushions. He preferred to sit up in a solidly upholstered armchair with his feet firmly on the ground, and he felt foolish sitting with an elderly bachelor on his bed of rose chintz gazing at the coffee and liqueurs on the low table between their outstretched feet. There was something club clubable, clubbable even, there was something clubbable, intimate, even rather feminine, about the scene, and none of these atmospheres was appropriate. Bond didn't like Nasser. Everyone was too rich. The winter visitors and the residents who had houses on the island talked of nothing but their money, their diseases and their, their servant problems. They didn't even gossip well. There was nothing to gossip about. The winter crowd were all too old to have love affairs and, like most rich people, too cautious to say anything malicious about their neighbours. The Harvey Millers, the couple that had just left, were typical, a pleasant, rather dull Canadian millionaire who had got into natural gas early on and stayed with it, and his pretty chatterbox of a wife. It seemed that she was English. She had sat next to Bond and chatted vivaciously about what shows he had recently seen in town and didn't he think the Savoy Grill was the nicest place for supper. One saw so many interesting people, actresses and people like that. Bond had done his best, but since he had not seen a play for two years and then only because the man he was following in Vienna had gone to it, he had, he had had to rely on rather dusty memories of London nightlife which somehow failed to marry up with the experience, the experiences of Mrs. Harvey Miller. Bond knew that the governor had asked him to dinner only as a duty, and perhaps to help out with the Harvey Millers. Bond had been in the colony for a week, and was leaving for Miami the next day. It had been a routine investigation job. Arms were getting into the Castro rebels in Cuba from all the neighbouring territories. They had been coming principally from Miami and the Gulf of Mexico, but when the U.S. Coast Guard had seized two big shipments, the Castro supporters had turned to Jamaica and the Bahamas as possible bases, and Bond had been sent out from London to put a stop to it. He hadn't wanted to do the job. If anything, his sympathies were with the rebels, but the government had a big export program with Cuba in exchange for taking more Cuban sugar than they wanted, and a minor condition of the deal was that Britain should not give aid or comfort to the Cuban rebels. Bonn had found out about the two big ca cabin cruisers that were being fitted out for the job, and rather than make arrests when they were about to sail, thus causing an incident, he had chosen a very dark night and crept up on the boats in a police launch. From the deck of the unlighted launch he had tossed a thermite bomb through an open port of each of them. He had then made off at high speed and watched the bonfire from a distance. Bad luck on the insurance companies, of course, but there were no casualties, and he had achieved quickly and neatly what M had told him to do. <laughs> so far as Bond was aware, no one in the colony except the chief of police and two of his officers knew who had caused the, the two spectacular and, to those in the know, timely fires in the roadstead. Bond had reported only to M in London. He had not wished to embarrass the governor, who seemed to him an easily embarrassable man, and it could, in fact, have been unwise to give him knowledge of a felony which might easily be the subject of a question in the legislative council. But the governor was no fool. He had known the purpose of Bond's visit to the colony, and that evening, when Bond had shaken him by the hand, the dislike of a peaceable man for violent action had been communicated to Bond by something constrained and defensive, in the governor's manner. Okay, John, I'll definitely consider some more uh, C.S. Lewis Chronicles of Narnia for you, my friend, and get them in the poll. So, yes, certainly. 
This had been no help to the dinner party and it had needed all the chatter and gush of a hard-working ADC to give the evening the small semblance of life it had achieved. And now it was only 9.30 and the governor and Bond were faced with one more polite hour before they could go gratefully to their beds, each relieved that he would never have to see the other again. Not that Bond had anything against the governor. He belonged to a routine type that Bond had often encountered round the world, solid, loyal, competent, sober and just, the best type of colonial civil servant, solidly, competently, loyally, he would have filled the minor posts for thirty years while the empire crumbled around him, and now just in time, by sticking to the ladders and avoiding the snakes, he had got to the top. In a year or two it would be the GCB and out, out to Godalming or Cheltenham or Tunbridge Wells, with a pension and a small packet of memories of palace of places like the Trucial Oman, the Leeward Islands, British Guyana, that no one of at the local golf club would have heard of or would care about. And yet Bond had reflected that evening how many small dramas such as the affair of the Castro rebels must the governor have witnessed or been privy to, how much he would know about the checkerboard of the small power politics, the scandalous side of life in small communities abroad, the secrets of people that lie in the, fl in the files of government houses around the world. But how could one strike a spark off this rigid, discreet mind? How could he, James Bond, whom the governor obviously regarded as a dangerous man and as a possible source of danger to his own career, extract one ounce of interesting fact or comment to save the evening from being a futile waste of time? Yeah, hey, uh, Stefano, yeah, that's it's right, isn't it? It's a nice metaphor there. Sticking to the ladders and avoiding the stakes. Hello there, Stefano. I hope you're doing well. Bond's careless and slightly mendacious remark about marrying an air hostess had come at the end of some desultory conversation about air travel that had followed dully inevitably on the departure of the Harvey Millers to catch their plane for Montreal. The governor had said the BOAC were getting the lion's share of the American traffic to Nassau because, though their planes might be half an hour slower from Idlewild, the service was superb. Bond had said, boring himself with his own banality, that he would rather fly slowly and comfortably than fast and unaccosted or uncosseted, excuse me. It was then that he had made the remark about air hostesses. Indeed, said the governor in the polite, controlled voice that Bond prayed might relax and become human. Why? Oh, I don't know. It would be fine to have a pretty girl always tucking you up and bringing you drinks and hot meals and asking if you had everything you wanted, and they're always smiling and wanting to please. If I don't marry an air hostess, there'll be nothing for it but marry a Japanese. They seem to have the right ideas too. Bond had no intention of marrying anyone. If he did, it would certainly not be an insipid slave. He only hoped to amuse or outrage the governor into a discussion of some human topic. I don't know about the Japanese, but I suppose it has occurred to you that these air hostesses are only trained to please, that they might be quite different when they're not on the job, so to speak. The governor's voice was reasonable, judicious. Since I'm not really very interested in getting married, I've never taken the trouble to investigate. There was a pause. The governor's cigar had gone out. He spent a moment or two getting it going again. When he spoke, it seemed to Bond that the even tone had gained a spark of life, of interest. The governor said, There was a man I knew once who must have had the same ideas as you. He fell in love with an air hostess and married her. Rather an interesting story, as a matter of fact, I suppose. The governor looked sideways at Bond and gave a short, self-deprecatory laugh. You see, quite a lot of the dreamy side of life. This story may seem to you on the dull side. But would you care to hear it? Very much. Bond put enthusiasm into his voice. He doubted if the governor's idea of what was seamy was the same as his own, but at least it would save him from making any more asinine conversation. Now, to get away from this damnably cloying sofa, he said, Could I have some more brandy? He got up, dashed an inch of brandy into his glass and, instead of going back to the sofa, pulled up a chair and sat down at an angle from the governor on the other side 
of the drink tray. The governor examined the end of his cigar, took a quick pull and held the cigar upright so that the long ash would not fall off. He watched the ash warily throughout his story and spoke as if to the thin trickle of blue smoke that rose and quickly disappeared in the hot, moist air. He said carefully, This man, I'll call him Masters, Philip Masters, was almost a contemporary of mine in the service. I was a year ahead of him. He went to Fetz and took a school, a scholarship for Oxford, the name of the college doesn't matter, and then he applied for the colonial service. He wasn't a particularly clever chap, but he was hard-working and capable, and the sort of man who makes a good solid impression on interview boards. They took him into the service. His first post was Nigeria. He did well in it. He liked the natives and he got on well with them. He was a man of liberal ideas, and while he didn't actually fr fraternise, which, the governor smiled sourly, would have got him into trouble with his superiors in those days, he was lenient and humane towards the Nigerians. It came as quite a surprise to them. The governor paused and took a pull at his cigar. The ash was about to fall, and he bent carefully over towards the drink tray and let the ash hiss into his coffee cup. He sat back and for the first time looked across at Bond. He said, I dare say the affection this young man had for the natives took the place of the affection young men of that age and other walks of life have for the opposite sex. Unfortunately, Philip Masters was a shy and rather uncouth young man who had never had any kind of success in that direction. When he hadn't been working to pass his various exams, he had played hockey for his college and rode in the third eight. In the holidays he had stayed with an aunt in Wales and climbed with the local mountaineering club. His parents, by the way, had separated when he was at his public school and, though he was, was an only child, had not bothered with him once he was safe at Oxford with his scholarship and a small allowance to see him through. So he had very little time for girls and very little to recommend him to those he did come across. His emotional life ran along the frustrated and unhealthy lines that were part of our inheritance from our Victorian grandfathers. Knowing how it was with him, I am therefore suggesting that his friendly relations with the coloured people of Nigeria were what is known as a compensation, seized on by a basically warm and full-blooded nature, had been starved of affection and now found it in their simple, kindly natures. <coughs> Hello there, Atari. Nice to see you again. Welcome back. Um, how are you this evening, this afternoon, this morning, wherever you might be? Welcome. <clears throat> Bond interrupted the rather solemn narrative. The only trouble with a, a beautiful negresses is that they don't know anything about birth control. I hope he managed to stay out of that sort of trouble. Excuse me, Jamesy. The governor held up his hand. His voice held an undertone of distaste for Bond's earthiness. No, no, you misunderstand me. I'm not talking about sex. It would never have occurred to this young man to have relations with a coloured girl. In fact, he was sadly ignorant of sexual matters, not a rare thing even today among young people in England, but very common in these days, and the cause, as I expect you will agree, of many, very many disastrous marriages and other tragedies, Bond nodded. No, I am only explaining this young man at some length to show you that what was to come fell upon a frustrated young innocent with a warm but unawakened heart and body and a social clumsiness which made him seek companionship and affection amongst the Negroes instead of in his own world. He was, in short, a sensitive misfit, physically uninteresting, but in all other respects healthy and able, and a perfectly adequate citizen. Bond took a sip of his brandy and stretched out his legs. He was enjoying the story. The governor was telling it in a rather elderly narrative style, which gave it a ring of truth. The governor continued, Young Masters' service in Nigeria coincided with the first Labour government. If you remember, one of the first things they got down to was a reform of the foreign services. 
Nigeria got a new governor with advanced views on the native problem who was surprised and pleased to find that he had a junior member of his staff who was already, in his modest sphere, putting something like the governor's own views into practice. He encouraged Philip Masters, gave him duties which were above his rank, and in due course when Masters was due for a move, he wrote such a glowing report that Masters jumped a grade and was transferred to Bermuda as assistant secretary to the government. <laughs> the governor looked through his cigar smoke at Bond. He said apologetically, I hope you aren't being too bored by all this. I shan't be long in coming to the point. I'm very interested indeed. I think I've got a picture of the man. You must have known him well. The governor hesitated. He said, I got to know him still better in Bermuda. I was just his senior and he worked directly under me. However, we haven't, got, we haven't quite got to Bermuda yet. It was the early days of the air services to Africa and, for one reason or another, Philip Masters decided to fly home to London and so have a longer home leave than if he had taken ship from Freetown. He went by train to Nairobi and caught the weekly service of Imperial Airways, the forerunner of BOAC. He had never flown before and he was interested but slightly nervous when they took off after the air hostess, whom he noticed was very pretty, had given him a suite to suck and shown him how to fasten his seatbelt. When the plane had levelled out and he found that flying seemed a more peaceful business than he had expected, the hostess came back down the almost empty plane. She smiled at him. You can undo the belt now. When Masters fumbled with the buckle, she leant down and undid it for him. It was an intimate little gesture. Mastered as Masters had never been so close to a woman of about his own age in his life. He blushed and felt an extraordinary confusion. He thanked her, she smiled rather saucily at his embarrassment and sat on the arm of the empty seat across the aisle and asked him where he had come from and where he was going. He told her. In his turn he asked her about the plane and how fast they were flying and where they would stop and so forth. He found her very easy to talk to and almost dazzlingly pretty to look at. He was surprised at her easy way with him and her apparent interest in what he had to say about Africa. She seemed to think he had led a far more exciting and glamorous life than, to his mind, he did. She made him feel important. When she went away to help the two Stepwoods prepare lunch, he sat and thought about her and thrilled to his thoughts. When he tried to read, he could not focus on the page. He had to be looking up the plane to catch a glimpse of her. Once she caught his gaze and gave him what seemed to be a secret smile. We are the only young people on the plane, it seemed to say. We understand each other. We're interested in the same sort of things. <laughs> Philip Masters gazed out of the window seeing her in the sea of white clouds below. In his mind's eye, he examined her minutely, marvelling at her perfection. She was small and trim, with a milk, milk and roses complexion and fair hair tied in a neat bun. He particularly liked the bun. It suggested that she wasn't fast. She had cherry, red, smiling lips and blue eyes that smark, sparkled with mischievous fun. Knowing Wales, he guessed that she had Welsh blood in her, and this was confirmed by her name, Rhoda Llewellyn, which, when he went to wash his hands before luncheon, he found printed at the bottom of the crew list above the magazine rack beside the lavatory door. He speculated deeply about her. She would be near him now for nearly two out for nearly two days, but how could he get to see her again? She must have hundreds of admirers. She might even be married. Did she fly all the time? How many days off did she get between trips? Would she laugh at him if he asked her to go out to dinner and a theatre? Might she even complain to the captain of the aircraft that one of the passengers was getting fresh? A sudden vision came to Masters of being turned off at the plane at Arden, a complaint to the current colonial office, his career ruined. Luncheon came and reassurance. When she fitted the little tray across his knees, her hair brushed his cheek. Masters felt that he had been touched by a live electric wire. She showed him how to deal with the complicated little cellophane pack, packages, how to get the plastic lid of the salad dressing, 
she told him that the sweet was particularly good, a rich layer cake. In short, she made a fuss of him, and Masters couldn't remember when it had ever happened before, even when his mother had looked after him as a child. Excuse me. Good evening, Nick. Welcome, my friend. I hope you're well, and nice to see you. <clears throat> At the end of the trip, when the sweating masters had screwed up his courage to ask her out to dinner, it was almost an anticlimax when she readily agreed. A month later, she resigned from Imperial Airways and they were married. A month after that, Masters' leave was up and they took ship for Bermuda. Bond said, I fear the worst. She married him because his life sounded exciting and grand. She liked the idea of being the belle of the tea parties at Government House. I suppose Masters had to murder her in the end. No, said the Governor mildly, but I dare say you're right about why she married him that and being tired of the grind and danger of flying. Perhaps she really meant to make a go of it, and certainly when the young couple arrived and settled into their bungalow on the outskirts of Hamilton, we were all favourably impressed by her vivacity and her pretty face, and by the way she made herself pleasant to everyone. And, of course, Masters was a changed man. Life had become a fairy tale for him, Looking back, it was almost pitiful to watch him try to spruce himself up so that he could live up to her. He took trouble about his clothes, put some dreadful brilliant brilliantine in his hair, and even grew a military-type moustache, presumably because she thought it looked distinguished. At the end of the day, he would hurry back to the bungalow, and it was always Rhoda, this and Rhoda that, and when do you think Lady Burford, who was the governor's wife, is going to ask Rhoda to lunch. <laughs> but he worked hard and everyone liked the, the young couple and things went along like a marriage bell for six months or so. Then, and now I'm only guessing, the occasional word began to drop like acid in the happy little bungalow. You can imagine the sort of thing. Why doesn't the colonial secretary's wife ever take me out shopping with her? How long must we wait before we can give another cocktail party? You know we can't afford to have a baby. When are you due for a promotion? It's awfully dull here all day with nothing to do. You'll have to get the dinner tonight. I simply can't be bothered. You have such an interesting time. It's all right for you. And so on and so forth. And of course the cosseting quickly went by the board. Now it was Masters, and, of course, he was delighted to do it, who brought the air hostess breakfast in bed before he went off to work. It was Masters who tidied up the house when he came back in the evening and found cigarette ash and chocolate papers all over the place. It was Masters who had to give up smoking and his occasional drink to buy her new clothes so that she could live up to the other wives. Some of this showed, at any rate, to me, who knew Masters well, in the secretariat. The preoccupied frown, the occasional enigmatic, over-solicitous telephone call in office hours, the ten minutes stolen at the end of the day so that he could take Rhoda to the cinema, and, of course, the occasional half-joking questions about marriage in general. What do other wives do all day long? Do most women find it a bit hot out here? I suppose women, he almost added, God bless them, are much more easily upset than men, and so forth. The trouble, or at least most of it, was that Masters was besotted. She was his sun and his moon, and if she was unhappy or restless, it was all his fault. He cast about desperately for something that would occupy her and make her happy, and finally, of all things, he settled, or rather they settled together, on golf. Golf is very much the thing in Bermuda. There are several fine links, including the famous Mid-Ocean Club, where all the quality play and get uh, all the quality play and get together at the club afterwards for gossip and drinks. <laughs> it was just what she wanted: a smart occupation and high society. God knows how masters saved up enough to join and buy her the clubs and the lessons and all the rest, but somehow he did it and it was a roaring success. 
She took to spending all day at the mid-ocean. She worked hard at her lessons and got a handicap and met people through the little competitions and the monthly medals. And in six months she was not only playing a respectable game, but had become quite the darling of the men members. Oh dear. Yeah, well, she sounds like a dream, but maybe a nightmare by the sounds of it now, Donna. Oh, I wasn't surprised. I remember seeing her there from time to time, a delicious, sunburned little figure in the shortest of shorts with a white eyeshade with a green lining and a trim, compact swim that flattened her figure, or flattered her figure, and I can tell you, the governor twinkled briefly, she was the prettiest thing I've ever seen on a golf course. Of course, the next step didn't take long. There was a mixed foursome competition. She was partnered with the oldest Tattersall boy, there the leading Hamilton merchants and more or less the ruling clique in Bermudan society. He was a young Helion, handsome as, as be damned, a beautiful swimmer and a scratch golfer, with an open MG and a speedboat and all the trimmings. You know the type. Got all the girls he wanted, and if they didn't sleep with him pretty quickly, they didn't get the rides in the MG, or the Chris Craft, or the evenings in the local nightclubs. The couple won the competition after a hard fight in the final, and Philip Masters was in the fashionable crowd round the 18th green to cheer them home. That was the last time he cheered, for many a long day, perhaps for all his life. Almost at once he started going with young Tattersall, and once started, she went like the wind. And believe me, Mr. Bond, the governor closed a fist and brought it softly down at the edge of the drinks table. It was ghastly to see. She didn't make the smallest attempt to soften the blow or hide the affair in any way. She just took young Tattersall and hit Masters in the face with him and went on hitting. She would come home at any hour of the night. She had insisted that Masters should move into the spare room, some pretext about it being too hot to sleep together, and if she ever tidied the house or cooked him a meal, it was only makeshift and to keep up some kind of appearance. Of course, in a month, the whole thing was public property, and poor Masters was wearing the biggest pair of horns that had ever been seen in the colony. Lady Burford finally stepped in and gave Rhoda Masters a talking to, said she was ruining her husband's career and so forth. But the trouble was that Lady Burford found Masters a pretty dull dog, and having perhaps had one or two escapades in her own youth, she was still a handsome woman with a twinkle in her eye. She was probably a bit too lenient with the girl. Of course, Masters himself, as he was to tell me later, went through the usual dreary sequence, remonstrance, bitter quarrel, furious rage, violence. He told me he damn nearly throttled her one night, and finally, icy withdrawal and sullen misery. Married life, eh? Sounds fun. Mm. More facts from Nick Cooper there. He says, Ian Fleming has an estate on Jamaica called Goldeneye. Used as the title of the book. Is he still alive then? Is he? When was, when was he published? Uh, 1960. Is Mr. Fleming still alive? Do we know anyone? Just curious. Just curious. Um... Hello there, SC Chick. Lovely, you say. Welcome. Hi there. <laughs> it's nice to see you all. I hope you, you're enjoying this. Uh, at the moment, it's not really uh, James Bond action, is it? It's just uh, this governor, or whatever he's called, the commissioner, telling a story about poor masters. It's just a tale of, of unhappy marriage and an affair at the moment. Okay, thanks, Nick. So I hope there's some James Bond action coming soon. I do hope it's not just this conversation about Masters' marriage, but I'm sure it's not. We've got about 10 pages to go, so let's hope it picks up a little bit. The governor paused. I don't know if you've ever seen a heart being broken, Mr. Bond, broken slowly and deliberately. Well, that's what I saw happening to Philip Masters, and it was a dreadful thing to watch. 
There he had been, a man with paradise in his face, and within a year of his arrival in Bermuda, hell was written all over it. Of course, I did my best. We all did in one way or another. But once it had happened, on that 18th green at the mid-ocean, there was really nothing to do but try and pick up the bits. But Masters was like a wounded dog. He just drew away from us into a corner and snarled when anyone tried to come near him. I even went to the length of writing him one or two letters. He later told me he had torn them up without reading them. One day several of us got together and asked him to a stag party in my bungalow. We tried to get him drunk. We got him drunk all right. The next thing that happened was a crash from the bathroom. Masters had tried to cut his wrists with my razor. That broke our nerve and I was de deputed and I was deputed to go and see the governor about the whole business. The governor knew about it, of course, but had hoped he wouldn't have to interfere. Now the question was whether Masters could even stay on in the service. His work had gone to pieces, his wife was a public scandal, he was a broken man. Could we stick the bits together again? The governor was a fine man. Once action had been forced on him, he was determined to make a last effort to stave off the almost inevitable report to Whitehall, which would finally smash what remained of Masters. And Providence stepped in to lend a hand. The very next day, after my interview with the governor, there was a dispatch from the colonial office saying there was to be a meeting in Washington to delineate offshore fishing rights and that Bermuda and the Bahamas had been invited to send representatives of their governments. The governor sent for masters, spoke to him like a Dutch uncle, told him that he was being sent to Washington and that he had better have his domestic affairs settled one way or the other in the next six months and packed him off. Masters left in a week and sat in Washington talking fish for five months and we all heaved a sigh of relief and cut road of masters whenever we, whenever we could find an opportunity to do it. Oh hey Laurie. <laughs> Hi there Laurie. Uh, yeah, the quantum of solace is nothing like this. I don't remember there being a conversation about a failed marriage in the film. So I'd agree with you there, Donna, but let's give it time. We, we've got 10 pages for it to, for it to get up into second and third gear. Let's see. The governor stopped speaking and it was silent in the big, brightly lit drawing room. He took out a handkerchief and wiped it over his face. His memories had excited him and his eyes were bright in the flushed face. He got to his feet and poured a whiskey and soda for Bond and one for himself. Bond said, what a mess. I suppose something like that was bound to happen sooner or later, but it was bad luck on Masters that it had to happen so soon. She must have been a hard-hearted little bitch. Did she, sh did she show any signs of being sorry for what she had done? Easy. The governor had finished lighting a fresh cigar. He looked at the glowing tip and blew on it. He said, oh no, she was having a wonderful time. She probably knew it wouldn't last forever, but it was what she had dreamed about, what the readers of women's magazines dream about. And she was pretty typical of that sort of mentality. She had everything, the best catch on the island, love on the sands under the palm trees, gay times in the town and at the mid-ocean, fast drives in the car and the speedboat, all the trappings of cheap romance. And to fall back on, a slave of a husband, well out of the way, and a house to have a bath in and change her clothes and get some sleep. And she knew she, sh she could get Philip Masters back. He was so abject. There would be no difficulty. And then she could go round and apologise to everyone and turn on the charm again and everyone would forgive her. It would be all right. If it wasn't all right, there were plenty of other men in the world besides Philip Masters and more attractive ones at that. Why, look at all the men at the golf club. She could have a pick of them at the drop of a hat. No, life was good. And if one was being a bit naughty, it was, after all, only the way plenty of other people behaved. Look at the way the film stars went on. In Hollywood. <laughs> well, she was soon put to the test. 
Tattersall got a bit tired of her and, thanks to the governor's wife, the Tattersall parents were making the hell of a fuss. That gave Tattersall a good excuse to get out of it without too much of a scene, and it was summer and the island was flooded with pretty American girls. It was time for some fresh blood, so he chucked Rhoda Masters, like that, just told her they were through, that his parents had insisted or they would cut off his allowance. It was a fortnight before Philip Masters was due back from Washington, and I will say she took it well. She was tough, and she had known it would have come have to come some time or other. She didn't squeal. For that matter, there was no one to squeal to. She just went and told Lady Burford that she was sorry and that she was now going to be a good wife to Philip Masters, and she started on the house and cleaned it up and got everything ship-shape, ready for the big reconciliation scene. The necessity for bringing about this reconciliation was made clear to her by the attitude of her former cronies at the mid-ocean. She had suddenly become bad news there. You know how these things can happen even in an open-handed place like a country club in the tropics. Now not only the government house set, but also the Hamilton merchant's clique frowned upon her. She was suddenly shoddy goods, used and discarded. She tried to be the same gay little flirt, but it didn't work any more. She got sharply snubbed once or twice and stopped going. Now it was vital to get back to a secure base and start slowly working her way up again. She stayed at home and set to wi- and set to with a will, rehearsing over and over again the act she would put on, the tears, the ho- the air hostess cosseting, the lengthy sincere excuses and explanations, the double bed. <laughs> There's um there's there's strong connections here at Book Club, Donna. I think we're all on the same wavelength, aren't we? So uh yes. And here we go, maybe this is the excitement we're waiting for. And then Philip Masters came home. The governor paused and looked reflectively over at Bond. He said You're not married, but I think it's the same with all relationships between a man and a woman. They can survive anything so long as some kind of basic humanity exists between the two people. When all kindness has gone, when one person obviously and sincerely doesn't care if the other is alive or dead, then it's just no good. That particular insult to the ego, worse, to the instinct of self-preservation, can never be forgiven. I've noticed this in hundreds of marriages. I've seen flagrant infidelities patched up. I've seen crimes and even murder forgiven by the other party, let alone bankruptcy and every other form of social crime, incurable disease, blindness, disaster. All these can be overcome, but never the death of common humanity in one of the partners. I've thought about this and I've invented a rather high-sounding title for the basic factor in human relations. I have called it the law of the quantum of solace. Mm. <clears throat> Bond said, That's a splendid name for it. It's certainly impressive enough, and, of course, I see what you mean. I should say you're absolutely right. Quantum of solace, the amount of comfort. Yes, I suppose you could say that all love and friendship is based in the end on that. Human beings are very insecure. When the other person not only makes you feel insecure, but actually seems to want to destroy you, it's obviously the end. The quantum of solace stands at zero. You've got to get away to save yourself. Did Masters see that? (laughs) The governor didn't answer the question. He said, Rhoda Masters should have been warned when her husband walked through the bungalow door. It wasn't so much what she saw on the surface, though the moustache had gone and Masters' hair was once again the untidy mop of their first meeting. It was the eyes and the mouth and the set of the chin. Rhoda Masters had put on her quietest frock. She had taken off most of her makeup and arranged herself in a chair where the light from the window left her face in half-shadow and illuminated the pages of a book on her lap. 
She had decided that when he came through the door, she would look up from her book, docilely, submissively, and wait for him to speak. Then she would get up and come quietly to him and stand in front of him with her head bowed. She would tell him all and let the tears come and he would take her in his arms and she would promise and promise. She had practiced the scene many times until she was satisfied. She duly glanced up from her book. Masters quietly put down his suitcase and walked slowly over to the mantelpiece and stood looking vaguely down at her. His eyes were cold his eyes were cold and impersonal and without interest. He put his hand in his inside pocket, pocket and took out a piece of paper. He said, in the matter-of-fact voice of a house agent, Here is a plan of the house. I have divided the house in two. Your rooms are the kitchen and your bedroom. Mine are this room and the spare bedroom. You may use the bathroom when I am not in it. He leant over and dropped the paper on the open pages of her book. You are never to enter my rooms except when we have friends in. Rhoda Masters opened her mouth to speak. He held up his hand. This is the last time I shall speak to you in private. If you speak to me, I shall not answer. If you wish to communicate, you may leave a note in the bathroom. I shall expect my meals to be prepared punctually and placed in the dining room, which you may use when I have finished. I shall give you twenty pounds a month to cover the housekeeping, and this amount will be sent to you by my lawyers on the first of each month. My lawyers are preparing the divorce papers. I'm divorcing you, and you will not fight the action because you cannot. A private detective has provided full evidence against you. The action will take place in one year from now when my time in Bermuda is up. In the meantime, in public, we shall behave as a normal married couple. <laughs> Damn. Mr. Masters certainly changed his tune, hasn't he? Yeah, I know, Donna, it's, uh, it's a little bit slow, but we've got five pages to go, so it might. Hello there, um, Jack Daniels. Nice to see you after a few busy days. <clears throat> and hello there, Char Gaming. Welcome. Hello, everyone. It's, it's lovely to see you all. And let's continue. Masters put his hands in his pockets and looked politely down at her. By this time, tears were pouring down her face. She looked terrified, as if someone had hit her. Masters said indifferently, Is there anything else you'd like to know? If not, you had better collect your belongings from here and move into the kitchen. He looked at his watch. I would like dinner every evening at eight. It is now 7.30. The governor paused and sipped his whiskey. He said, I've put all this together from the little that Masters told me, and from fuller details Rhoda Masters gave to Lady Burford. Apparently Rhoda Masters tried every way to shake him, arguments, pleadings, hysterics. He was unmoved. She simply couldn't reach him. It was as if he had gone away and had sent someone else to the house to represent him at this extraordinary interview. And in the end, she had to agree. She had no money. She couldn't possibly afford the passage to England. To have a bed and food, she had to do what he told her. And so it was. For a year they lived like that, polite to each other in public, but utterly silent and separate when they were alone. Of course, we were all astonished by the change. Neither of them told anyone the arrangement. She would have been ashamed to do so, and there was no reason why masters should. He seemed to us a bit more withdrawn than before, but his work was first class and everyone heaved a sigh of relief and agreed that by some miracle the marriage had been saved. Both of them gained great credit from the fact and they became a popular couple with everything forgiven and forgotten. The year passed and it was time for Masters to go. He announced that Rhoda would stay behind to close the house and they went through the usual round of farewell parties. We were a bit surprised that she didn't come to see him off in the ship, but he said she wasn't feeling well. So that was that until, in a couple of weeks, news of the divorce case began leaking back from England. Then Rhoda Masters turned up at Government House and had a long interview with Lady Burford and gradually the whole story, including its really terrible next chapter, 
leaked out. The governor swallowed the last of his whiskey. The ice made a hollow rattle as he put the glass softly down. He said, apparently on the day before Masters left, he found a note from his wife in the bathroom. It said that she, sh she simply must see him for the last time, for the last talk before he left her forever. There had been notes like this before and Masters had always torn them up and left the bits of the note on the shelf above the basin. This time he scribbled a note giving her an appointment in the sitting room at six o'clock that evening. When the time arrived, Rhoda Masters came meekly in from the kitchen. She had long since given up making emotional scenes or trying to throw herself on his mercy. Now she just quietly stood and said that she had only ten pounds left from that month's housekeeping money and nothing else in the world. When he left, she would be destitute. You have the jewels I gave you and the fur cape. I'd be lucky if I got fifty pounds for them. You'll have to get some work. It'll take time to find something. I've got to live somewhere. I have to be out of the house in a fortnight. Won't you give me anything at all? I shall starve. Masters looked at her dispassionately. You're pretty. You'll never starve. Oh, wow. That's a, uh, that's a rather damning... Um, cold comment isn't it you're pretty you'll never starve you must help me philip you must it won't help your career having me begging at government house nothing in the house belonged to them except a few odds and ends they had taken it furnished the owner had come the week before and agreed the inventory there only remained their car, a Morris that Masters had bought second-hand, and a radio gramophone he had bought her as, as a last resort to try and keep his wife amused before she took up golf. Philip Masters looked at her for the last time. He was never to see her again. He said, All right, you can have the car and the radiogram. Now that's all. I've got to pack. Goodbye. And he walked out of the door and up to his room. The governor looked across at Bond. At least one last little gesture, yes, the governor smiled grimly. When he had gone and Rhoda Masters was left alone, she took the car and her engagement ring and her few trinkets and the fox fur tippet and went into Hamilton and drove round the pawnbrokers. In the end she collected forty pounds for the jewellery and seven pounds for the bit of fur. Then she went to the car dealers whose nameplate was on the dashboard of the car and asked to see the manager. When she asked how much he would give her for the Morris, he thought she was pulling his leg. But, madam, Mr. Masters bought the car by higher purchase, and he's very behind, he's very badly behind on his payments. Surely he told you that we had to send him a solicitor's letter about it only a week ago. We heard he was leaving. He wrote back that you would be coming in to make the necessary arrangements. Let me see. He reached for a file and leafed through it. Yes, there's exactly two hundred pounds owing on the car. <laughs> oh dear karma hey karma yeah i've got both tonight uh jack daniels stroke rob coffee and uh, apple and black crown i think it is so yeah it appears that a uh, rhoda or rhoda is uh getting her comeuppance hmm Yes, there's exactly £200 owing on the car. Well, of course, Rhoda Masters burst into tears and in the end the manager agreed to take back the car, although it wasn't worth £200 by then, but he insisted that she should leave it with them then and there, petrol in the tank and all. Rhoda Masters could only accept and be grateful not to be sued, and she walked out of the garage and along the hot street, and already she knew what she was going to find when she got to the radio shop. And she was right. It was the same story, only this time she had to pay ten pounds to persuade the man to take back the radiogram. She got a lift back to within walking distance of the bungalow and went and threw herself down on the bed and cried for the rest of the day. She had already been a beaten woman. Now Philip Masters had kicked her when she was down. <laughs> the governor paused. Pretty extraordinary, really, a man like Masters, kindly, sensitive, who wouldn't normally hurt a fly. And here he was, performing one of the cruelest actions I can recall in all my experience. 
It was my law operating, the governor smiled thinly. Whatever her sins, if she had given him that quantum of solace, he could never have behaved to her as he did. As it was, she had awakened in him a bestial cruelty, a cruelty that perhaps lies deeply hidden in all of us, and that only a threat to our existence can bring to the surface. I'll read a Donoran or oh, Jack's, uh, yeah, Jack Daniels. It's not re really what I'd read either, but again, it's won, it's won the poll. What does Donna say here? Um, very telling of the male and female characteristics, I guess. I thought Mr. Bond was the player, but it appears the book is much different to the movies. Yes, Donna is very different, and it will be very uh, interesting to see if Octopussy and For Your Eyes Only and A View to Kill are equally disparate, nowhere near what the, what the film's like. But last couple of pages, I don't think it's going to, I don't think there's going to be any car chases or action or shootouts. So, okay, we can discuss at the end. Masters wanted to make the girl suffer, not so much as he had suffered, because that was impossible, but as much as he could possibly contrive. And that false gesture with the motor car and the radio gramophone was a fiendishly brilliant bit of delayed action to remind her, even when he was gone, how much he hated her, how much he wanted still to hurt her. Bond said, It must have been a shattering experience. It's extraordinary how much people can hurt each other. I'm beginning to feel rather sorry for the girl. What happened to her in the end? And to him, for the matter of fact. The governor got to his feet and looked at his watch. Good heavens, it's nearly midnight, and I've been keeping the staff up all this time. He smiled, as well as you. He walked across to the fireplace and rang a bell. A negro butler appeared. The governor apologised for keeping him up and told him to lock up and turn the light out. Bond was on his feet. The governor turned to him. Come along and I'll tell you the rest. I'll walk through the garden with you and see that the sentry lets you out. They walked slowly through the long rooms and down the broad steps to the garden. It was a beautiful night under a full moon that raced over their heads through the thin high clouds. The governor said, Masters went on in the service, but somehow he never lived up to his good start. After the Bermuda business, something seemed to go out of him. Part of him had been killed by the experience. He was a maimed man. Mostly her fault, of course, but I guess that what he did to her lived on with him and perhaps haunted him. He was good at his work, but he had somehow lost the human touch, and he gradually dried up. Of course, he never married again, and in the end, he got shunted off into the ground nut scheme, and when that was a failure, he retired and went back to live in Nigeria, back to the only people in the world who had shown him any kindness, back to where it had all started from bit tragic, really, when I remember what he was like when we were young. And the girl? Oh, she went through a pretty bad time. We handed round the hat for her, and she pottered, and she pottered in and out of various jobs that were more or less charity. She tried to go back to being an air hostess, but the way she had broken her contract with Imperial Airways put her out of the running for that. There weren't so many airlines in those days, and there was no short of odd shortage of applicants for the few hostess jobs that were going. The Burfords got transferred to Jamaica later in that same year, and that removed her main prop. As I said, Lady Burford had always had a soft spot for her. Rhoda Masters was pretty nearly destitute. She still had her looks, and various men had kept her for a while, but you can't make the rounds for very long in a small place like Bermuda, and she was very near to becoming a harlot and getting into trouble with the police when Providence again stepped in and decided she had been punished enough. A letter came from Lady Burford enclosing her fare to Jamaica and saying she had got her a job as receptionist at the Blue Hills Hotel, one of the best of the Kingdom Hotels. So she left, and I expect, I'd been transferred to Rhodesia by then, that Bermuda was heartily relieved to see the last of her. The governor and Bond had come to the wide entrance gates to the grounds and government house. Beyond them shone white and black and pink under the moon the huddle of narrow streets and pretty clapboard houses with gingerbread gables and balconies that is Nassau. 
With a terrific clatter, the sentry came to attention and presented arms. The governor raised a hand. All right, stand at ease. Again, the clockwork sentry rattled briefly into life, and there was silence. The governor said, and that's the end of the story, except for one final quirk of fate. One day, a Canadian millionaire turned up at the Blue Hills Hotel and stayed for the winter. At the end of the time, he took Rhoda Masters back to Canada and married her. She's lived in Clover ever since. Good heavens, that was a stroke of luck. Hardly deserved it. I suppose not. One can't tell. Life's a devious business. Perhaps for all the harm she'd done to Masters, fate decided that she had paid back enough. Perhaps Masters' father and mother were the true guilty people. They turned Masters into an accident-prone man. Inevitably, he was involved in an emotional crash that was due to him and that they had conditioned him for. Fate had chosen Rhoda for its instrument. Now fate reimbursed her for her services. Difficult to judge these things. Anyway, she made her Canadian very happy. I thought they both seemed happy tonight. Bond laughed. Suddenly, the violent dramatics of his own life seemed very hollow. The affair of the Castro rebels and the burned-out yachts and the stuff of an adventure strip in a cheap newspaper. He had sat next to a dull woman at a dull dinner party, and a chance remark had opened for him the book of real violence, of the comedy humane where human passions are raw and real, where fate plays a more authentic game than any secret service conspiracy devised by governments. Bond faced the governor and held out his hand. He said, Thank you for the story, and I owe you an apology. I found Miss Harvey Miller a bore. Thanks to you, I shall never forget her. I must pay more attention to people. You've taught me a lesson. They shook hands. The governor smiled. I'm glad the story interested you. I was afraid you might be bored. You lead a very exciting life. To tell you the truth, I was at my wit's end to know what we could talk about after dinner. Life in the colonial service is very humdrum. They said good night. Bond walked off down the quiet street towards the harbour and the British Colonial Hotel. He reflected on the conference he would be having in the morning with the Coast Guard and the FBI in Miami. The prospect, which had previously interested even excited him, was now edged with boredom and futility. The End well, clubbers, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't very impressed with that. Um, maybe because of the high standards of books that we read here at Book Club, that one was w well below par. And I suppose that's that, isn't it? There's nothing we can do. We can't get this hour and ten minutes back that we've spent reading it. And reading that, it being the title page or the title story, this little um, Penguin Classics book is called Quantum of Solace, the complete James Bond short story. So if that's the title story, you know, they're selling the book with that one. I'm not sure what we should think about the other stories but if anyone's read any of the others um <laughs> if anyone's read any of the others if any there's any uh, i don't want to disrespect any ian fleming fans but there's the other stories in it are from a view to kill for your eyes only risico the hildebrand rarity octopussy the property of a lady the living daylights and 007 in new york and if you are um, brave enough to comment because if you comment and say this one's quite good um, then it will be your name <laughs> but no I'm only joking so that story has put me off Ian Fleming for the time being if anyone's desperate to hear any of those other James Bond stories you must let me know like I said I'll get it in the comment uh, sorry, in the polls, not the comments. You guys can comment and I'll get it in the polls. But like I say, that was uh, subpar. And I think it's probably more um, more to do with the great books that we read than maybe Ian Fleming. 
So, uh, hello there, Catherine. Catherine says, hey, Lewis and fellow clubbers. Um, welcome, Catherine. Lovely to see you. <laughs> and uh, I'll get to Caroline's uh, thing in a in a moment. Laurie says, oh, well, got my blood pressure up. <laughs> and I hope that's... Uh, I don't know whether that's... Um, I don't know how to take that, uh, Laurie. So you can give me some clarification if necessary, but okay. Donna says, there's a much more interesting backstory to 007. There's rumours of him in history dating back to John D. And, and yeah, I'd, ima I'd imagine the the Secret Service, right? MI5, all these things. They're pretty serious, pretty serious guys. I've got a friend whose son is, is off into the secret service, if you like, MI5, SAS. So it is a real thing. I've got this friend whose son's going there and it doesn't feel real, even for me or this guy, but it is real. Um, Donna says, surely such an epic amount of movies can't be based on that book. <laughs> yeah, well, who knows? Who knows? Uh, just like every film... They have a, a a wide berth when it comes to artistic, um, <laughs> when when it comes to artistic freedom, so they just do what they want, right? Uh, Caroline Songbird says Thoreau would not have been impressed. So, yes, I think you're right, uh, Caroline, but. Don't worry, because tomorrow we'll be reading Thoreau, and I don't think that will disappoint. I think it will be full of wisdom and um, quotes and insight, just like all the other chapters. So that's tomorrow at 8.30. We can recover from our Ian Fleming, uh, I don't know, I don't want to, I don't want to disparage or be rude, but okay. Sometimes you miss, eh? Sometimes you miss. And Nick Cooper summarised it very nicely. I think this, this is where we can end it. Um, and Donna Harper agrees. Nick Cooper says, Thank you, Lewis. The best thing about it is the title. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that tickled me. Um, that tickled me, Nick. And so let's leave this stream on a high note with Nick's very entertaining comment there which has perked the whole stream up, <laughs> and let's leave it there. Um, but first, Laurie says, four raspberries on this one. Blood pressure because I hate calculating people, Lewis. Uh, I understand now, uh, Laurie. Laurie says, four raspberries. So, damn. Donna agrees with Nick about the title. Uh, Caroline Songbirds may be very happy and gleeful for Walden tomorrow. And Donna says, like the character in the book, it was all fur coat and no knickers. <laughs> yeah, well, that's very true as well. So I suppose I can only apologise for that. But at least now we know maybe no more Flemings on the channel and we'll go off into other directions. But you've got to give these things a chance. How do you know? If you don't try them, if you don't taste them, if you don't sample them. Um, and that's that. Let's move on. Soul Sister says, thanks for reading to us. You're very welcome. And uh, good night, night, everyone. And I'll echo that sentiment from Soul Sister there. Night, night, everyone. Sweet dreams. Have a great week. And we'll be back tomorrow with Walden Chapter 3, which I believe is Solitude. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, Laurie B, you're very welcome. Laurie says, sorry, Laurie says, uh, thank you, Lewis. I love to hear you read. And that's very kind of you to say. I'm glad you enjoy the readings. You're welcome, Caroline Songbird. It's my pleasure. And I can only apologize for... Uh, that story but we'll be back tomorrow with Walden and then Beelzebub which never disappoint so um no Jack Daniels Jack Daniels says thank you Lewis would you recommend watching back no watch something else <laughs> okay 
Guys, Walden tomorrow, Beelzebub on Wednesday. Look after yourselves. Have a great week. And I hope you can make tomorrow for Walden Chapter 3. Take care, guys. Bye now.